Howdy. I'm Megan. And I'm David. And we're proud to be showcasing Vietnam and Vietnamese culture on behalf of the Vietnamese Student Association at Texas a and or TAMU VSA. We're the co-cultural chairs for the organization, so we'll be representing Vietnam and our organization. And we're also responsible for sharing and bringing the culture alongside its customs and traditions to you. So we'll start off with country appearance. Vietnam can be divided into three main regions and parts. Northern Vietnam, Minh Bac, Central Vietnam, Minh Trung, and Southern Vietnam, or Minh Nam. Most of the cities are concentrated in the northern and southern regions, as Central Vietnam consists of a lot of mountain and highland territory. These three regions also have high, slightly different dialects, which we'll go into later in two of the slides. And Vietnam is home to some incredible cities and sites. It's one of the fastest growing countries in the world, but it still manages to maintain its unique identity. From the roads still busting with motorcycles and mopeds, the preferred method of transportation to this day, to the packed streets full of fresh produce markets and food vendors, there's a lot to unpack when exploring Vietnam. Here's a little bit about a couple of the different cities that make up the breathtaking country alongside a few landmarks. So first we have Hanoi. Hanoi is the capital of Vietnam. And this picture is specifically of Quang Kim Lake, a very popular leisure slash recreational spot. Quang Kim means um, return of sword. And the name comes from an ancient legend of a king who was granted a magical sword from the heavens to fight off Chinese invaders. And later, while boating on the lake, the sword was taken by a giant turtle down to the depths of the lake so it could be returned back to the gods. Rumor has it that giant turtles still roam at the bottom of the lake, making for some fun story times and what ifs. And also on this slide, we have Halem, and it's home to the Halem Bay, which is located off the northern coast of Vietnam. This was named one of the new seven wonders of the world by many, and lots of tourists like to visit because of the natural beauty of the gulf and its iconic rock formations. And on this next slide, we have Nha Trang. And Nha Trang, as you can tell, is a city right by the seaside, Nike, and other big tourist destinations for obvious reasons. Its beautiful white sand beaches and resorts are arguably the most famous in Vietnam and perfect for scuba diving and snorkeling. It's also a shopping center in Mecca, home to one of the country's most popular night markets and the Dam Market, a three story department like store building, complex building high, piled high with anything you could possibly need. And finally, it's also one of the few places where you can go and visit the archaeological remains of the Dam Empire an indigenous group that inhabited Vietnam long ago. Da Lat, on the other hand, is a city on a plateau in the highlands, so the altitude is higher and the climate is chillier, colder than most other Vietnamese cities. Da Lat is also known for its beautiful landscape, which is quite different from the rest of Vietnam, and has lakes, pine-covered hills, and peaks, and it has a lot of variety of vegetation. So they have a lot of vegetables, flowers, and fruits, anything, you name it. And because of that lats, cooler temperatures, and the high altitude in the fertile area, it's an agricultural hotspot. You can find a lot of things that will flourish and grow here that you wouldn't find anywhere else. And markets oftentimes will emphasize the maiden dala on their produce and products. And on this next slide, we have just some additional pictures and info on the archaeological remains that I brought up when talking about Nha Trang. So the leftmost picture is of Po Nagar Tower in Nha Trang, and the two rightmost pictures are pictures of Po Quang Garai Temple in Phang Ban, another city in Vietnam. The beautiful woman on the right in the right picture is my mother. Phang Rang is actually her, her hometown. And uh, yeah, there's, uh, there's a highly extensive history regarding the Jem Empire, the indigenous group in Vietnam. These buildings are primarily religious structures, so there's a lot to unravel with their religious practices alongside their kingdoms and war history. So I encourage y'all to do a little bit of your own research if you're curious. So on this next slide, we have Saigon, or Ho Chi Minh, and that's another city in southern Vietnam. So when most people think of Vietnam, this city is the one of the first that come to mind. And it's the largest and most populous city, the most technologically advanced, and it's the city in the country with the number one economy. It's considered the superpower and metropolis of Vietnam. They're super famous for their pho which is the unofficial official national dish of Vietnam, like a lot of other Vietnamese cities, but they'll boast the country's biggest variety of international Vietnamese food. You'd definitely be spoiled if you came for a visit. Definitely. And then on the bottom there, we have Phu Wuk. Uh, Phu Wuk is the largest tropical island in Vietnam. There's two pictures there. Yeah, it's close to Cambodia and Thailand. Um, as you may be able to expect and tell, the seafood and fisheries market is here is among the freshest and best in the world. 
Food Book is home to some of the world's best fish sauce in addition to their high quality seafood, pearls, and pepper. Um, its economy is growing fast because of the rise in tourist attraction and inter- international resort recognition. Um, it's not quite as famous as Nha Trang, but it is getting there. So. And now we have delicacy dishes um, at food, so everyone's favorite, right? So Megan and I will talk to you about these twice in the delicious creation in clockwise order. So first, directly under the header, we have Bumba Wei. Um, Bumba Wei is a yi noodle dish that was catered to the taste of the people of Wei, a city in central Vietnam that really loves spicy food. It's made up of thick cuts of beef and pork, fresh herbs and vegetables, a little bit of lime juice, and of course, a tantalizing, visually red-hot broth. This is one of my personal favorites because I love spicy food. Uh, yeah, I'm not a big fan of spicy food, so this is more up my alley. Uh, now we have egg rolls. The left are an actual egg dough, and then the right is with rice paper. And that's a cha yao and nam rang. This is served with sweet and sour dipping fish sauce, or nuk nam. And similarly, there's also spring rolls. Spring rolls are different from egg rolls in the fact that they aren't fried, and they're packed with shrimp, pork, herbs, and vegetables. And they're refreshing, less heavy, and paired with a savory peanut sauce which is my favorite, and along with the usual fish sauce. Yeah, and then next is banh mi, um, to the left of the spring rolls. Um, this is where we see the French colonization and influence take play. A banh mi is typically comprised of a fresh baguette, uh, cucumber, pickled carrots, and daikon, cilantro, mayonnaise, and all kinds of meats. This can range from Vietnamese pork sausage, known as gian luo, um, pate, meatballs, cold cuts, barbecue, and etc. Um, there's such a wide variety of banh mi, but it'll make you want to try every last bit of Okay, now we have bun seo. It's a savory Vietnamese crepe or pancake, and it has pork, shrimp, bean sprouts on the inside with herbs and vegetables. And my grandma makes this for me, and I love how crunchy it is, especially on the outside, so it's my personal favorite. Yeah, that is pretty good. I had that last week. Um, and then we have, last but not least, pho. Pho is definitely, uh, for, many, for many Vietnam's most classic and popular dish, and it's the favorite and or first dish that comes to mind when talking about the country. But honestly, if anyone says they don't love pho, they're lying. Um, the main ingredients are the rich broth, which is usually prepared for, for prepared beforehand the whole day beforehand, um, rice noodles, chicken or beef, and fresh herbs on top. Uh, mint, basil, bean sprouts, and lime juice are usually the, the staples and go-tos, and people also make sriracha and oyster sauce to put in and dip with as well. There's a lot more dishes we wish we could show y'all, but we figured we'd just highlight these for today. So all in all, Vietnamese dishes and cuisine follow a lot of the same patterns. We like to blend and incorporate a lot of these different flavors and textures. Sweet, savory, sour, umami, and soft, chewy, and crispy. A common foundation you'll see is carbs, which is rice, rice noodles, and flour dishes, fresh meats, and fresh or pickled herbs and vegetables and and sauces. There's not a whole lot of things that are actually fried, so Vietnamese food is actually one of the healthiest overall and everything is a must try, so come hungry. Yes, yes. And then finally, we are moving on to language and dialects. Um, that's right, plural. Um, so the key numbers here are that Vietnamese has 12 vowels, five accents called Yao in the Vietnamese, and 29 letters. The accents are the most important aspect of the language for anyone wanting to learn and nor understand it. And you'll notice that Vietnamese words have characters that are pretty much exactly the same as English letters. The only difference being Vietnamese heavily uses diacritics for pronunciation and tones. Vietnamese did originally use basically Chinese characters for their language, but French colonization later had Vietnam adopt the Latin alphabet that we know and use today. Yep, and so these accent marks are what make learning as Vietnamese interesting, but also tricky. Vietnamese is tonal and monosyllabic, meaning that almost all the words have only one syllable. Um, this means a person has to really nail the tone and pronunciation the first time to really communicate effectively. Of course, uh, context is everything and helps a lot with understanding what's being said. But if you can, le- you can learn these fundamentals, it'll make everything a whole lot easier. And uh, because Vietnamese is tonal, uh, you make use of accents a lot. The accents are understood by looking at these uh, accent marks, slash diacritics, slash tone marks, you know, whatever you want to call them. They're all pretty much the same concept. In the letters in each individual word. They're like little glyphs, and using a different one in a word with the exact same spelling can completely change the meaning. Um, and for example, if we look here, um, there are six different accents and they, ha- and they have names in English. And some of them we actually see and use in English and, and other romantic languages. I mean, we have these six and then the respective names that you want to emphasize and address in Vietnamese. So we have the level, uh, cute, uh, grave, hook above, tilde, and the underdog mark. 
uh, and then in Vietnamese is there giáo ngang, giáo sắc, giáo quyền, giáo hội, giáo ngã, giáo nặng. And I'll just go through all these these first four words really quick so y'all can hear the so y'all can hear all of them and hear if you can see if you can spot the the subtle differences. So we have ga 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 and ga. So yeah, I don't know if y'all heard those differences, but yeah, they're really really subtle. Um, especially for people that are not quite experienced in Vietnamese. Basically, ga means to sing. It's unmarked, right? So there's no mark. And ga ga that's a yaw sac. That's the acute mark. It's a little bit of a higher tone. Um, then ga yo wing. It's the grave mark. Grave is in like lower, right? So it's a little bit lower. And then um, ga hoi. So it's like a little bit of a question of a question tone, right? Because you know the yaw hoi looks like looks like a cup of a question mark. So so yeah. And then these last two um, yo ga and yo nan. So for a lot of people, um, they'll be confused with um, uh, yo hoi and yo nga. Um, this is usually because, especially for the southern dialect, um, they don't really discern clearly as the northern do. Um, between uh, yo, the tobi and the, I mean, the hook above and the tobi mark, so it's really hard. Um, but yeah, for these words, um, be means to draw, and then be, um mother. So yeah, and those are basically the bread and butter of the Vietnamese language. Um, yeah. So on top of all the different accent marks, there are also different dialects for northern, central, and southern regions of Vietnam. They all pronounce these words slightly differently in their respective accents. Uh, the most prominent example, I'd say, is between the northern and southern dialects. So for the fourth letter of the Vietnamese al- Actually, I'm not sure which number, but it's a letter that looks like a D in English. The north will use a Z sound for the letter, but the south will use a Y sound with more Y sounding words. Yeah, the letter D. Um, yeah, going off of that, that bold red word at the bottom right there with its English name in parentheses, you know, cucumber. Megan's family resides from the north, so they pronounce it like Zuleo. While now my family residing from the south, we pronounce it like Yuleo. And the, best, the last example is for the central dialect and accent. Um, and most of the time, it's pretty clear that a person speaking in Vietnamese will lean more towards a northern dialect or a southern dialect. However, the central dialect is a bit, bit rare, right? So it's the most distinctive one in the fact that it's so different from the northern and southern. The central dialect usually sees people slurring their phrases more and having a more laid-back tone. And so going back to cucumber, right, um, they would say yileo instead of yu leo, yileo. You I don't know if you can hear it yet. It's, it's a little bit weird, but it's a little bit subtle and it's kind of more stretched out. Uh, uh, so yeah. And so now we're, we'll move on to Vietnamese customs and traditions. So these are some of the biggest cultural things that Vietnam has historically brought to the table as a country that are still significant and observed today. Yeah, uh, and from left to right we have the practice of ancestor worship, and then the two biggest holidays of the year, Lunar New Year, and the on a moon festival, and then lastly, the giving of lisi or red envelopes. And we'll also be talking about arts such as music and dance as well, and then fashion. And so the end all be all of Vietnamese holidays is Vietnamese Lunar New Year, or Thut. And this is the most celebrated and biggest event of the year, commemorating the arrival of spring based on the lunar calendar, usually in late January or early February. In 2021, um, it'll be on February 12th, so be on the lookout for that. And people celebrate by holding festivals and parades, which include, which include lion dancers, dragon dancers, concerts, performances in general, and fireworks. The holiday all encompassing includes putting on decorations like banners, yellow flowers like apricot blossoms, chrysanthemums, and then banners and lucky cats. Visiting family and friends, family and friends gatherings, ancestor worship, huge feasts, playing the dice gambling game, Baokua um, Thumka, which is board, crab, shrimp, fish, and of course, the giving of New Year's wishes and Lisi. There are also a lot of widespread beliefs or superstitions about what to do and what not to do around Thut. For example, you're not supposed to clean the house during Thut season or else you'll sweep away the good luck that the New Year brings. Other examples include get your hair cut before Thut as to not look cut off the good luck during, uh, don't borrow or ask for money and pay all of your bills and debts before Thut so you aren't indebted for the rest of the year and many more. Yeah. And on top of that, there are also many beliefs and traditions that come with the actual holiday. 
uh, like they see or the red lucky money envelopes, which children receive from the older members of the family after wishing them good health and good luck for the new year. So last year, 2020 was the year of the rat, but you'll notice in this picture it says year of the ox, which is what the 2021 Lunar New Year will be. Each year is based on the zodiac, which consists of 12 animals, and over the years they rotate through in the same set order. The purpose of the zodiac is usually to see what kind of good fortune the year will bring. Different animals on the zodiac bring different types of good fortune for people, as well as influencing their personalities and determining compatibilities with other people based on what animal corresponds with their birth year. So kind of similar, con it's a kind of similar concept to horoscopes in the West. Dave was born in two thousand, so he's a dragon, and I was born in two thousand one, so I'm a snake. Yeah, um, and then also for Lunar New Year, as well as many other holidays, the practice of ancestor worship is prevalent. So oftentimes, alongside the usual big and important festivities, even these people will worship the spirits of their ancestors, asking for their blessings and good health every Lunar New Year. Um, families guys gather to feast with each other but also with the ancestors with their ancestors who have passed. I'm offering them food, um, incense, burning money, and paper, um, and other material things such as clothes, shoes, a house, bicycles. Um, yeah, and believing that their ancestors can come back temporarily to receive these offerings and to bring the families further blessings of good fortune for the new year. And finally, more food, which is our favorite. So for that, there's actually... A big three of dishes you'll see that are must-have to eat every year, like how America likes to have turkey, stuffing, and pies for Thanksgiving. A lot of Vietnamese celebrations in general, you'll see what will be paired always with feasts and a lot of food. Yep, exactly. Um, so there's can go wa, stuffed bitter melon soup, you know, in, uh, yeah, in clockwise order right there. Um, ban te, um, a glutinous sticky rice cake um, that can be filled with either a savory or a sweet filling, and te kha tao. It's a braised caramelized pork belly with egg, uh, usually served with rice, as you can see, yeah. And on the bottom right, though, you'll see a spread of all kinds of different Vietnamese foods, staple foods, along with the big three. So yeah, the feast isn't limited, um, so bring your favorite dishes to the potluck. Just make sure you have the big three, the essentials. So Mid on a Moon Festival, or Bet Trung Thu, is the other big important holiday in Vietnamese culture. It falls every year on the 15th day of the 8th month of the lunar calendar with a full moon, which is about 8 months after Lunar New Year. And that usually falls around mid-September to early October, but it changes every year. The full moon represents a time of prosperity and fullness of life, and people celebrate for many reasons, like to give thanks, to spend time and make up lost time with the fullness of their families, to give thanks for the bountiful harvest of crops brought by a dragon summoning rain, across this time and many more yeah and so this holiday is also sometimes called the children's festival with the emphasis being mainly on children because they are viewed as pure and innocent so they can connect better with the sacred natural and spiritual worlds people celebrate it's a very similar to lunar new year with lion dances parades spending time with their families and ancestor worship the two new main additions and uh, main additions though are lighting lighting and flying lanterns and giving and eating moon cakes or ban tung to And now we'll move on to traditional music, uh, which are some more tra traditions outside the big, two big holidays. Uh, traditional music in Vietnam has been around for a very long time, seeing a lot of influence from traditional Chinese music and other Eastern Asian countries like Japan, Korea, and Mongolia. Culturally, you'll see Vietnamese music and dance usually used for festivals, religious activities, entertainment, for easy listening on the ears and in people's daily lives for recreation and enjoyment. There's a lot of influence from Chinese music. Uh, it's pretty evident whether you think of stringed instruments like harps and erhus, but they also have their own, Vietnamese culture also has their own fair share of stringed instruments and ethnic groups within Vietnam overall have their own special and unique types of instruments and these are just a couple. Yeah, exactly. And so in clockwise order, then, you see we have, you know, on the top right, we have uh, Dang Bao, which is like a monochord zither, a string instrument, it's one string. Um, and then on the bottom right there, uh, Dan, Dan Ye, which is type of, a type of lute, which is like a folk guitar. Yeah, and then to the left of that, we have a drum, it's like a huge, this huge bamboo xylophone. And then on the far left, we have uh, Dan Ye, which is a type of fiddle. 
Um, and in the middle right there, you can see it's like a traditional Vietnamese orchestra, um, showcasing all the traditional Vietnamese instruments in music. So. And then for traditional dance, um, so traditional dance in Vietnam dates way, way back. Most of the history regarding traditional dance in Vietnam ties in with traditional music um, and traditional theater as well. And so you would see traditional dance in a lot of places, in the, in the theater, at the opera, and then at festivals and parades. And most notably, um, most, most notably in the, in the Imperial Court for Royal Royalty Entertainment. Um, so in these traditional dance is seen as elegant and skillful. So there's an increasingly big demand to see dance promoted and performed and preserved for many years to come. Um, over the course of the 30s to the 80s, Vietnam really started to take inspiration from other parts of the world, especially from the West, including America. Gai Lâm is one of the most famous types of Vietnamese traditional dance. It's performed modernized type of folk opera that became especially popular during this time in the French colonial period. It combines elements of folk songs, classical music and opera, and modern spoken drama and theater. They can be thought of kind of like traditional musicals where there's very loud and expressive belting, singing and storytelling along with beautiful intricate costumes and with extravagantly sparkly dresses and shiny warrior armor. And next, lots of people are also familiar with the fan dance or Wufian, which is also the performed for royal families at their anniversaries and other celebrations. Tamu VSA actually plans to perform a fan dance sometime in the near future, so be on the lookout for that. Yes, and then uh, finally, maybe arguably the most iconic dance that you might have seen before and or will see often, especially during Lunar New Year season, is lion dancing. Usually one dancer will operate the head and then one dancer will operate the rear. And so lion dance performances are without a doubt valued and adored because of their vibrant colors, animated personalities, energetic movements with loud banging drums, entertaining interactions with audiences, and most importantly, good luck. You'll see lion dances at a lot of big occasions like store openings, store grand openings, um, Lunar New Year and Mid-Autumn like we talked about before, birthdays, weddings, and these are primarily, yeah, they're used to fight off bad vibes and evil spirits. Ooh. And then last but not least, we have traditional clothing slash fashion. Ao literally means shirt and gar shirt slash garment in Vietnamese. And there's been lots of beautiful traditional variations with fine silk fabrics, long robes, and intricate patterns in Vietnam's long histories since around 4,000 years ago. You'll definitely see some East Asian cross-culture inspiration and fusion. So the most well-known piece of traditional clothing is the Ao Yai, which is on the far left, and that has different versions for men and women. The women's version is a long dress with any sleeve length. In this case, or this picture, it's a long sleeve over wide leg pants, and sometimes it has a headpiece. The men's version has a long tunic that is usually patterned in some way. It may also have a headpiece and can be worn with just pants and shoes. There's lots of different occasions for them with different styles for each occasion, including school uniforms, weddings, and celebrations. Yeah, and if you go back to this first slide of presentation right here, um, you'll see, you can see Megan and I wearing some mad guys. Males and females will usually wear visibly contrasting colors like this. I mean, like you'll see red for women and blue for men a lot. Um, and I'm wearing a headpiece, but Megan's not, right? And so, they can also be special, like these green ones right here you see on the very far left. Um, yeah, and then in the top middle is Al Ba Ba. Al Ba Ba is like the Al Yai, but it's a much shorter tuning for both men and women. And it was the main clothing worn in the rural countryside of Vietnam. The bottom middle is an example of Ao Tu Tong, which was the formal northern Vietnamese clothing before the 18th century. Uh, you'll see the style of clothing being worn a lot when looking at traditional dances. Yep, and then lastly, um, Ao Ngak Tin, the three on the far right, right there, were considered dynasty clothes, wearing worn during the Wing Dynasty. Um, this one is lesser known, lesser known in the Ao Yai because of their exclusiveness and prestige for the elite, but are very luxurious and fancy and definitely worth noting and talking about. As you can see right there, um, Empress, the last Empress of Vietnam, uh, Nam Phuong, wearing a Ngak Tin circa 1933 quite some years ago, yeah? So, yeah, that's it for our culture showcase. Uh, thanks, and good go. Uh, we want to thank y'all for listening and watching and letting David and I share a slice of Vietnamese culture with you today. Yeah, thank y'all so much. And we hope y'all enjoyed hearing, hearing a, lot, a lot about what Vietnamese culture has to offer, and we hope y'all learn more on your own. Thanks, and good go.